So let me first thank you for joining this uh, this Capella webinar. Um, Daniel, can you can you go to the second slide, please? Yes. Uh, I'm Samuel Rocher. I work for Obeo, and I will be your moderator today. Uh, I just wanted to inform you, for everyone, that uh, as we are a lot attending this webinar, uh, your microphone is mute to just to avoid background noise. Uh, and after the talk, you will have a Q&A session. So uh, to ask your question, please use the dedicated Q&A windows uh, and not the chat. Uh, it will be much more easier for me to, to retrieve your, your question just after. As usually, uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Capella YouTube channel in the, in the next days. Uh, next slide, please, Danilo. Okay, thanks. So, it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce our speaker today, uh, Danilo Palamin de Almeida. Danilo is a space systems engineer from the NanoSat CBR2 mission at TNP, the Brazilian Institute for Space Research. And today, Danilo will present how CubeSat based missions have been modeled with Capella. And more precisely, uh, he will describe how the model uh, defining an initial architecture mission and CONOPS uh, is used to generate a script that configures satellite simulator with the corresponding mission parameters. So glad uh, you're with us, Danilo. And without further ado, I will give you the floor. OK, thank you, Samuel, for the introduction and uh, for being here. Let's see if I can get the pointer. I think it's working. OK, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danilo. I will be presenting uh, our application using uh, Arcadian Capella talking about the modeling and simulation of CubeSat-based missions concept of operations. So a quick introduction, uh, my name is Danilo. Um, I'm a space systems engineer. Uh, this work was performed at Brazil's National Institute for Space Research during my master's. I was uh, also working as a systems engineer for the NanoSat CBR2 mission and with some smaller participation in the support mission and Cron 1 missions. My background is in mechatronics engineering, and I'm a space exploration enthusiast, also advocate for uh, democratized access to space. The reason I got into modeling is that the higher the complexity of system, I found the greatest the significance of communication. And as some of you may agree that models can greatly improve communication and engineering. So currently, uh, after finishing my, my, my master's, I am now working for Endurosat as a systems engineer. And at Endurosat, we engineer, build, and operate exceptional nanosats. Uh, our shared satellite service enables customers to launch and operate their payloads in orbit without having the complexity to launch and, or and operate their own satellites. We also offer uh, tailored satellite missions for to attend your special needs, and we also offer a full stack of CubeSat components. Okay, so onwards to the presentation. Um, a brief introduction of the work. So it was, as I mentioned, developed during my master's at Brazil's National Institute for Space Research. Um, it all began by investigating modeling practices to assist the early stage design phase of space mission. Um, both of my supervisors, uh, they were part of the Concurrent Engineering Center team at INPI, uh, called C Prime, uh, where operation scenario simulation is used for trade studies. And we were discussing a lot about that. So. Uh, they, they use a simulator that was internally developed called Forkland that we'll talk a little bit about. And everything resulted in a modeling process uh, developed to guide the modeling of a CubeSat-based mission and the CONAPS for early stage design studies, preparing for the oper operation scenario simulation. So to do this, uh, we generated a non-specific mission model uh, and also a specific mission model for the BR2 that I was working on. So I'll show them to you to, so we can um, see how it goes. So by concept of operations, I mean how the system will operate to meet stakeholder expectations. So it's basically a description of the system's characteristics from an operational perspective. It can include a lot of different representations and um, uh, model views. And a lot of different institutions use different documentation standards, so there's no consent um, on how to do this. Uh, the, the ECSS has a couple of different documents. There's a large documentation volume, that a lot of uh, redundant information. So we came to a conclusion that this could benefit from uh, model-based system engineering. Uh, why Capella and Arcadia? So we 
first of all, the integrated tool and method was great, a great combination for what we were designed to do, like a step-by-step -step process to uh, achieve the end model. Um, it's an open source tool, so that reduces a lot of barriers to entry, of entry, and especially good when you're a student uh, looking uh, where to start and how to start. And it was also great that it allowed for our own plugin development, which enhanced the tool for a specific application, which I will show later on. Um, it's the main specific modeling language was very intuitive and comprehensive. So it's very friendly when discussing the model uh, with people that are not used to UML, SysML standards. And we also had some great previous experience from colleagues that were former MP students, um, which are now professors at their own institutions and they're using Capella and Arcadia there. So we had a community that we could discuss the models and uh, get some feedback. So talking about a little bit about the satellite simulator first. So Impis uh, Supreme's four plan simulator, satellite simulator is a functional simulation. It performs functional simulation of satellites and associated ground segments to reflect operational scenarios of the mission under analysis. Uh, so this is used for early stage uh, studies at uh, the Concurrent Engineering Center. And it has some simulation core modules that are composed of the space environment module, the equipment module, the power module, and the onboard data handling and telecommunications module. So it's written in Judy language, and it was all developed by Impi's Dr. Hono Chagas. If you're interested more in it, you can access his website or send him an email. Um, the simulator is almost uh, uh, public access. It's uh, in the process of being released to the public. Uh, so this is uh, a screenshot of the graphical user interface. You can see uh, while the simulation is being performed where the satellite is, there's also a 3D view. Uh, it shows the equipment on board, the power that it, they are consuming, some information about the, the power subsystems, and also you can see so the memory usage of the, of this, the whole system. So to get to know the simulator, I went to deep into the code, and I used Capella to uh, model uh, to create an initial model to discuss with the developer uh, the inputs that were required by the user and how everything works. So Capella was really useful for just a uh, simple diagram. He wasn't used to Capella. It was uh, very intuitive to, to talk and, and uh, share information about that. So we defined the required inputs from the user so we could uh, move on with the modeling to get that um, the inputs model. So to configure for a plan, it's based on a, a script, a Julius script. Uh, this is a small part of it. So, uh, for example, configuring the equipment list that will be on board the, the, the satellite. So for each equipment is instance, we have the core method, um, a name for it, the, the equipment, the, so each equipment, the function, so we call the operation function, that at every step of the iteration of the simulation, it gets evaluated and returned based on the parameters, the operation parameters, and the conditions that's described inside of the, the operation function. It returns whether the equipment is on, how much it's consuming in terms of power, and how much data it's generating. So that's basically it. Uh, so instead of uh, going into the code for everyone that wants to configure this, it, it will be beneficial to have a model to automatically generate this. So as I mentioned, we arrived at a modeling process uh, while we were developing the models. And this was the core of my dissertation. So it's uh, developed based on Arcadia. And it's a set, a set of sequential steps to uh, generate a model of the space mission concept of operations and prepare operational scenarios for a simulation. So it begins at a high level of abstraction and the mission objective as operational capabilities. And iteratively, we can decompose functions until we reach an equipment level on the spacecraft and the facilities for the ground segment. Uh, and the last step, we model parameters for the operation scenario simulation and transform the model into the input for the simulator. Uh, so these are the Capella artifacts that we use for at each uh, phase of Arcadia. So we start with the operational capabilities, and then we go all the way using the, the data flows and architectures, uh, allocating the functions to the architectures uh, at each uh, analysis step. And the last part, we reach a class diagram, which we use the class diagram to automatically generate the code for the simulation. So generating the configuration script, we, we developed the plugin. So Forplan is, uh, as I mentioned, configured through a Julia script, and Capella is Eclipse-based. And the language was built on the EMF, the modeling uh, framework. And we use this uh, Capella 1.3.1. So I don't know if the uh, newer versions of Capella will still have the same support for this. 
Uh, this is still something we need to see. But um, so we developed a plugin to retrieve the model elements and generate the Julia code based on their attributes. This was done uh, through the advanced project uh, in partnership with the Budapest University of Technology and Economics with the geniuses Pensa and Vince. Uh, we used Xtend, which is a Java dialect uh, specifically designed for model transformation code generation. Uh, so we defined a set of rules for the class diagram and the creation of the class instances according to each of the uh, model elements. So this way, the plugin transverses the, the instance models and derives the arbitrary code from it. So here you can see the, the files that we use in the plugin. Uh, and this is associated with Eclipse. OK, so let's uh, talk about the example model so we can see how uh, the modeling went. So first of all, I'm introduced the Nanosat CBR2 mission, which uh, I modeled for. So it's the satellite, second satellite of the Nanosat CBR program, a partnership between uh, Brazil's National Institute for Space Research and the Federal University of Santa Maria. Um, it's a scientific and technological scientific and technological mission. So it has uh, three physical payloads. Uh, the SLP SLP payload is a uh, Langmuir probe. It's it, it's aim it aims to collect data to better understand the magnetic anomaly of the Southern Atlantic and also to uh, understand the formation of plasma bubbles at the, in the uh, ionosphere. Uh, the second payload is a fault-tolerant attitude determination system, which we call the SDATF. And the third payload, finally, uh, which we call the SMDH, is a, a payload which has a radiation-tolerant FPGA and ASIC system. So also the, the mission aims to, the program itself, aims to develop human resources with experience in space missions. So here you can see the Nanosat CBR2, or in short, NCBR2. Uh, shortly after we finished uh, the assembly integration and testing at our uh, testing facility at INPI. So we first begin uh, with the operational analysis, as in the Arcadia method shows. So uh, the objective, as mentioned in Arcadia, is what the users of the system need to accomplish. So we define the objectives as operational capabilities and associate them with the entities and actors that are involved with the process. So for example, if we want to study the equatorial plasma bubbles, we have the sun, earth, uh, and the end users, and we concentrate everything in the mission operator as well. So then we just define the set of uh, operational activities and allocate them to each of the actors and entities involved, uh, and define also the interfaces between them so we can get a clear representation of things that are going to operate. Um, so that's it for, quickly for the first step. And for the uh, system analysis, we transform the, the operational activities into system functions. And then we allocate the system functions into the system that the system will operate. So previously, as uh, the operational perspective, we don't take the system into consideration. We just want to see what the users want to accomplish. And then we see which of those uh, functions will be uh, performed by the system, define the boundaries. And for example, here we could have had some ground instruments that would be outside the system uh, that would still would be part of uh, data collection. So that would be outside of the system, for example. Uh, so this step is really quick as well, just to determine the boundaries and how the users will retrieve the data. So at this point, we start at the logical step. We start breaking down, uh, decomposing the functions into the space segment and ground segment. So to keep this uh, simple, we so space, space segment functions in light green, uh, ground segment functions in dark green, and blue, we have external actor functions. Uh, so to keep this simple, we, we start uh, specifying logically how the data will be collected, and we separate it into two different types of uh, missions. So we, we can either reach uh, an operation time, so a periodic or a time-based operation for our uh, equipment, or a uh, region-based, uh, location-based operation for each of uh, the equipment. And we have all the interfaces uh, to, to reach that. Um, so here's for the VR2, uh, an example. So cutting off some uh, actor functions to keep the diagram uh, visible. Uh, so we, for each of the payload, we determine how it's going to, to work, if it's going to be a specific location-based or a time-based operation for them. And then we allocate the functions to the space segment and ground, se uh, ground segment at the logical architecture. Uh, so here we have the, the, also the interfaces between the system, the space segment, and the ground segment, and the external actors and entities. 
So this is the most important step, the physical uh, architecture step. So we start with the physical data flow of this base segment. So we decompose those logical functions into functions that the equipment on board the spacecraft that we want to represent are going to perform. So this is for a, a non-specific mission. Uh, I just listed a couple of uh, basic functionalities for some CubeSats that are common to a lot of missions. So we decompose them into what uh, common equipment or on board of uh, uh, CubeSats. And uh, we have, we should um, then allocate them to the, each of the equipment that are on board. And it's an iterative process, right? So uh, as you decompose, you see more equipment that you want to uh, put on board and then you uh, define functions for them. So this was uh, the data flow for the BR2, uh, a little bit simpler for, than the, the uh, non-specific mission. So we can define also some functional chains to better understand the flow of information for each uh, payload uh, collection, data collection. So and then for each uh, function, we have to allocate that to the uh, equipment on board the spacecraft that we want to represent. And using this iterative process, we can reach and uh, understand which equipment we will need on board. And then after we allocate all of the, the, the functions that we, we have to the equipment, we'll see uh, we have a, an initial architecture of uh, what are the equipment on board the spacecraft. So the same goes for the ground segment. We decompose the functions into uh, what we, uh, how we understand, we need to understand um, the flow of information of how the, the, the telemetry is going to be uh, received, distributed to the users, and also defining commands to be sent to the, uh, to the satellite and then allocate them to either ground stations or a mission control center. And we, we can better represent and understand how the end users are going to access the data. So uh, uh, finally, we can use uh, exchange scenarios to define the sequence of steps that uh, all the functions are going to take. So we can uh, re represent exactly the operation scenarios uh, sequentially and how everything is going to partake. So uh, as I mentioned, we all uh, we gather all the information into the class diagram, and um, we organize them into data packages. Unfortunately, Capella 1.3.1, I'm not sure if the newer versions uh, have this uh, already, but it did not have support for multiple meta levels for the class instances. So we can define, for example, a uh, higher class uh, meta level uh, of equipment and then derive uh, some class instances from them. So that means that each data package and uh, a class that we are defining will have to be uh, using hard-coded names that from this uh, example model. So each equipment, for example, inside the platform and payload, they have these specific uh, attributes to them and the operation function as well. Uh, the ground station has these specific attributes. We define some physical quantities with the units uh, to, to make the things clearer. Uh, so we have the regions of interest, which are the locations that the location-based equipment will operate. Um, we can define the solar panel array, the mass memory, the uh, onboard the spacecraft, of course, the orbit parameters, the battery pack that's onboard the spacecraft, and the ground stations. So this is uh, the template for that. Uh, each equipment has an operation function, as I mentioned before. So currently, we have implemented four types of uh, operation function, the always on, which uh, means that is it's always going to be on. Um, an operation function specifically for ground stations, uh, when we're above ground stations, this is uh, very useful for uh, transmitter and receivers. Um, Time-based operations and location-based operations or region of interest-based operations. Uh, so these, these functions can be automatically uh, translated to the Julia script. Um, we can obviously uh, develop more more later on. So this is what the class diagram for the Nanosat CBR2 missions look like, looks like. So we define uh, the equipment for the platform, equipment for the payloads inside uh, the payload data package, the, each of the solar panels inside the solar panel array, um, the ground stations, both of them, uh, the regions of interest, so the magnetic anomaly of the southern planet, uh, the regions where we believe we have equatorial plasma bubbles. Uh, so orbit parameters, battery pack, and mass memory, as I mentioned. So we can add values to each of these properties by double-clicking them. We'll have this property menu, and then setting this default value here. We click the edit button, set the default value, and then 
our plugin can retrieve uh, the value for that. Uh, and also for each operation function, it's basically the same. You double click the function, but uh, you can add the parameters. This one specifically uh, is the region of interest. So uh, we can add the parameters to be uh, you know, region of interest, which is uh, the arms or summer in English. So. Uh, and then, so this is a quick snapshot of one of uh, the, the files. So this is the extent code. So we can see that it's retrieving uh, model elements. So for example, the value of the property of efficiency, depending on uh, if it's a, a fixed type solar panel or a rotating uh, solar panel. And it, uh, at, it gets the value of the properties and assign them to the script that we're, we're generating. And then, uh, we can, when everything is uh, set up the way we want to, the, the class diagram, we can come to the Melody model, Melody Modeler file. We inserted a menu uh, item here, Julia Transformation menu. You just click Transform Classes, and then it uh, access all of the, the class diagram and transform the classes into the Julia configuration file, which uh, this is an example, so a part of it, obviously. So the whole file is uh, minimized here, but um, so you can see it, uh, this is automatic generated code from the model that I uh, previously showed, so some part of it, so the equipment, uh, creation, solar panels, battery, uh, and then the script has a footer that calls all of the functions in uh, the simulator and starts the simulator running, it gets it running. So I, do we have some time to go into um, the trace study example? I think so, right? Yes, yeah, definitely. Okay. So this is just a quick uh, trace study example to so we can see how the simulation uh, using the code, the model transformation to uh, do some simulations. So NCBR2 had already passed the design phase. However, the, the payloads and their operation were altered during development and we had a lot of uh, power and data budget limitations. Um, so uh, we quickly defined here three operation scenarios balancing um, payload operation time with power and data budgets. Um, so we can fit the power uh, and data budgets accordingly. Um, so it's a, we described the polar orbit with two ground stations here in Natal and Santa Maria. It's a 2600 uh, milliamp hour battery pack and no sun pointing for the satellite. Um, so in the first scenario, just for a quick reference, we uh, put everything always on to so max operation parameters for all of the, the payloads. Uh, we can see that the battery is quickly depleted in 34 hours. So here's, uh, we just, uh, sorry, I skipped this, but here we simply put uh, the, the operation function as always on for each of the payloads. And then the plugin uh, automatically converts this to the simulation script. Uh, and we can uh, generate the simulation executed and we can see that the battery is quickly depleted and the data is uh, through the roof it, in less than 48 hours we already max our um, onboard memory and we can download it up. so this is just for a quick reference and then uh, we try to get things balanced so uh, we try to time operation for one payload each, payload each orbit uh, so again we can see we just change the parameters of uh, we change the operation function and then the parameters inside it so for a timed operation for each of the payloads, uh, and then we can see that the power has uh, the power budget has been uh, achieved. We, we stabilized it, but still producing too much data uh, that we can download. Um, so after a couple of iterations, talking to the stakeholders and seeing what we can balance, we reached an operation scenario that would uh, be a valid operation scenario. So using the uh, SLP, the Langer probe uh, payload, uh, as a uh, location-based operation. Uh, over the uh, Amos, the Southern Atlantic Man uh, Magnetic Atom Anomaly, sorry, uh, and one orbit each for the SMDH payload and the SDATF payload. Uh, also, we have to lower the sampling frequency for each of the payloads, lower and lower, consequently, the data volume. So we reached a valid operation scenario which uh, has the battery or the power budget balanced out and also the memory, we can download enough uh, all the memory that we, all the, the data that we generate. So these are the, the results. Uh, we can show the, the, the stakeholders the results and discuss at each iteration of the simulation uh, how the, the operation of each payload would uh, be sufficient. 
So as a conclusion, um, the, the mod we, we generated models from mission operation objectives to an initial architecture for simulation and analysis. Um, it's transforming the models to the simulation was a quick way to generate different operation scenarios without having to directly code for the simulator. Uh, this is also good for someone that doesn't want to go heads deep into the simulator code to understand how to um, configure the simulator itself. So it's also simpler than manually coding for every scenario. Uh, also, we can go directly to the class diagram if you already have in mind uh, the initial architecture for uh, your space mission. Just uh, configure the class diagram as I showed before and do the automatic uh, transformation for the simulation. The results were used to drive the final concept of operations for the NCVR2 mission, which we later on uh, had some software issues which we had to change, but the results definitely uh, were used uh, to drive those uh, the final uh, concept. And Arcadia and Capella were great for the, developing the models and the process. Um, it was a very short learning curve to get the basics and to get everything going on. It was uh, great for discussing the model as well with uh, those who are the stakeholders that don't, uh, they're not familiar with SysML and UML standards, for example. So thanks a lot for listening. I uh, hope you have some questions. Okay, thanks, Danilo. Uh, presentation it for enlightening us. Um, we have one question, uh, okay, but good. I'm sure more will come shortly. Uh, so, as a reminder, feel free to send your question in the Q and A window uh, at the, the right of your screen. So, first, first question: uh, How would you model the different life cycle phases? Uh, for instance, development, qualification, operation, and so on. Uh, to allow for information to be transferred between the phases. Mm, okay, so that's... Uh, I would have to think a lot about that because, uh, I mean, this, uh, this whole process is for the initial phase of the satellite mission where we just want to discuss the initial concept of operation, do the simulations, get some uh, feedback for each of the, the stakeholders to discuss valid operation scenarios. So I guess that's uh, something that we, we have to discuss a lot on. Okay, and maybe I can add more for Duncan that there is a dedicated uh, webinar on how to model modern states in Capella. Maybe you can find some answer on this on this topic. Uh, okay, so well, we will wait for additional questions. Uh, in the meantime, I'm curious to know about uh, uh, the time you you spend to develop your own code generator. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, what is, what was the effort to develop your uh, your code generator? Okay, so luckily we had the geniuses from uh, BME, the University of uh, Budapest. And uh, in one month, they could get everything going, uh, with some trimming later on, but they were incredibly uh, experienced with Eclipse already. So they had some really, uh, it was quite straightforward for them. Well, it's quite surprising we don't have so much. Oh, okay, we have another one. That was my bad. <laughs> yeah, no the, the remaining question was hidden. Um, Okay, someone is uh, surprised to uh, not seeing any thermal analysis. Uh, is uh, such kind of analysis can be done? What type of anal analysis, sorry? A thermal analysis. Thermal analysis. Uh, yeah, that's a different scope uh, than what we were ex uh, expecting to model here. Um, yeah, so we don't encompass thermal analysis. Sorry. Uh, okay. Um, how do you come from the system model to the class diagram? Uh, is it uh, an automated or manual work? Uh, so at every step from uh, each Arcadia level, we can automatically uh, bring each of the functions that were previously described. So this is great for model uh, for functional spacing as well, traceability. Uh, and then we decompose these functions into what uh, we desire for that step. So from the system, we go to the logical analysis step, and we uh, as okay. So from this step, we generate the logical functions from those steps, and we decompose them into how the data will be collected for each of the equipment. So 
to make these the things simple, we separate it into two different types. Uh, so for time-based operation and location-based operation, uh, and I added some other uh, some other functions as well, which based from my experience in CubeSat missions, which is attitude control, uh, electrical power generation as well. So this is all a reference in the, the model. You can see it later, uh, and you define for each of the the the, the payloads in a the payload specifically uh, how they're going to do that. So if it's time-based operation or location-based operation, and then we reach the physical level, which is another uh, decomposition of those logical steps. Uh, so if we want to uh, we we want we want to describe the functions that will be on the equipment that we want to uh, use on the simulation. So I, uh, for this non-specific mission, I listed a lot of uh, functions that are common for spacecrafts, for uh, CubeSats, and the equipment that are on board. So if you want to go in a deeper level, so for more uh, detailed equipment, you can decompose even further these functions and then attribute these, uh, uh, these functions to each of the equipment on board. So here you have the initial architecture, and then you see the equipment that you have. And then from this uh, equipment list, you create the class diagram with this template to uh, for each class using the equipment that you created and also the rest of the simulation configuration. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thanks. Um do you think it would be possible to, to generate uh, simulated telemetry signals from the model you have developed? Repeat that, please. Uh, do you think it would be possible to generate uh, telemetry signals? From the model? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't execute this model because uh, Capella, at least 1.3.1, didn't have model execution. So that's actually one reason we did the plugin to send for the simulator, but it could be incorporated into the simulator itself. The simulator today doesn't uh, have support for telemetry generation, um, but it's something that could be worked on, of course. Thanks for that. Uh, next question. Uh, is a conversion from class description to Julia script based on a DSL transformation? Based on a DSL transformation. Domain specific language transformation, I guess. Yeah. Uh, uh, for sure. I mean, um, the extend classes here, they go into uh, the property values that are defined inside Capella, uh, inside Eclipse, and it's all based on the, the Capella language inside that. So uh, these, uh, these functions grab the, the properties from uh, the model that is generated from Capella. So. Um, yes. Yeah, it, it's a tricky question because it, basically everything is DSL based. So yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, is it possible to use this approach for bigger space system like constellations? Um, so the 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 four plan satellite simulator at this point does not yet uh, implement um, sim um, constellations, but it's uh, obviously envisioned. Um, and we just uh, limited it to CubeSats to have these functions uh, that we were describing along the, each of the steps to have uh, constraints around everything. So um, it obviously can be made for larger space missions, not only specifically CubeSats. The four plan satellite simulator is for satellites, not CubeSats. I mean, the whole class of satellites. Uh, and at one point, yes, uh, it's a goal to have uh, constellations in four plan, yes. Okay, thanks. And how long did it take uh, to model all you presented? Um, so this was done during my master's. So from like when we decided what the project was, from when I finished everything, of, of course, it was an iterative process. So I guess like took one year for the whole thing, but um, after we already knew uh, what was going on in a couple of months, maybe four or five months, I guess. It's yeah. hard to t hard to see. <laughs> okay, and next one is a quite good question. Uh, how do you make sure your models is in line with your requirements? Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> um, 
So, so I guess it would depend on the requirement. So we would uh, get the model, uh, use it in uh, the simulation, and then compare to see if the simulation and the operation would attend the operation requirements. That's for operation requirements, obviously. Uh, but I guess other type of requirements would depend on your own types of uh, determinations. So that's a hard question to answer, I guess. Yeah, I'm not sure everybody can answer this question. Yeah. <laughs> um, really, I mean, and prove it. Uh, anyway, so beside equipment parameters, uh, which kind of analysis can be done with Kappa? Uh, is something related with the project management or operation procedure can be done, for instance? Mm, I would not know how to answer that question, virtually. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's not, not so easy because it, well, it's a question about uh, Capella itself and not so much about your mm -hmm. specific use. Um, okay, so we still have time for a few questions, so feel free to, to sum, sum them. Okay, how much would it be to adapt this tool to another mission simulator? Or maybe to another mm -hmm. mission first, and, and I will ask you for another mission simulator. Yeah. So for the mission simulator, uh, we would have to go uh, and understand what the simulator inputs would be, so how you would uh, configure the simulation tool um, itself, and what are the inputs, what are the parameters you want to describe, how you want to create the satellite instance, uh, how you describe the orbit parameters, everything like that. And then we would change uh, the plugin to the specific uh, way to generate the file or however input um, would be necessary for the simulator. So we were lucky, uh, for plan is everything is configured through a single uh, script. So we collect all of the model information and then we output them in a specific way the configuration script should be created. And so you would have to understand your specific uh, other simulation tools, for example, I don't know, GMAT, uh, SDK, uh, understand how they would be uh, configured and then create uh, the file or files uh, based on the model parameters of uh, the model that we've defined for that specific simulator. Okay, thanks. Um, how to decompose the top level parameter? How to decompose the top level function? Yes. Um, so I guess you mean coming from the system operation and system analysis to this? Well, well, the, the question mentioned param just parameter, but uh, well, probably yes, this is more about how to decompose the function. Yeah, so I guess uh, for decomposition is about functions. <laughs> Maybe, uh, so from so this each of these steps is. Uh, it was based on what I would expect for some CubeSat missions, and we discussed with uh, my supervisors, and we determined that these this would be the way. So from collecting the mission data, we define how it would be collected, so by the uh, location-based or time-based. And then for the physical step, we determined these functions would be necessary to do that. So if you, are, uh, if you would like, we can discuss that more uh, in, in a direct fashion. Um, and uh, you can just send me a message, we can discuss that specifically. Um, and you mentioned that uh, you use some functional chains. Uh, yep. Could you elaborate on uh, your usage of functional chains? Functional chains are, uh, for this specific purpose, are just really uh, for visualization. So if uh, we want to determine some functional chains to describe how each of the payloads, uh, the, the, the functional chain for the payload, um, it, it was just to represent that. So you can use it for defining the whole flow of information, for example. Uh, but again, if you use too much functional chains, uh, everything gets maybe too much information on the same screen. So um, for this specific application, I use it just to determine uh, for each payload to uh, enhance visualization to see how we, where they would be going to. Okay, and is it possible to get the Capella model for demo purpose? Uh, 
um, in in uh, in some time, yes, uh, not now, but uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll uh, get this uh, open access for sure. Okay, thanks. Um, okay. Um, different scenario uh, were modeled uh, by modifying the model. And the question is, is it possible to instead define the variance in the model and run automatically an analysis for each variant? Mm, so I guess that would depend. So the way Forplan works today is we execute one simulation of uh, one operation scenario and then it runs the operation scenario. We would have to uh, develop some code on top of that to do some, uh, or maybe if you do like some sort of macro that uh, gets this model elements and calls multiple times uh, the Forplan simulator to do a lot of different um, simulation scenarios, that could be an option. Uh, that would be more direct, not having to change the, the carbon simulator you know, code itself. Um, and then we would have to add some extra parameters here in uh, the class elements, because here we only define for one operation scenario, of course. So uh, yeah, we would just uh, probably call them by different types of uh, values for like one orbit, two orbits, three orbits. But I guess it, yeah, you could automate that. Uh, so that would be the way yeah, I guess there's a more matter about uh, is there a solution to generate uh, models from a 150% model and there is, okay, some dedicated tool to do that and, and well, it would be possible using those, those features to, to adopt yeah. such an approach, I, I guess. Um, okay. Uh, well, I... I I guess the next uh, answer will be the same as uh, as uh, is the capital model available. Uh, is the uh, documentation of your, your work will be uh, available? Yeah, today it's uh, open access at INPI's uh, virtual library. So you can access uh, my dissertation there. That's uh, everything is documented in there. And we are in uh, soon we'll be publishing some uh, papers on the topic. Okay, so we have reached the end of the questions. So, well, thanks for your time and uh, for all those insights. It was a nice book, I have to say. And, and thanks for the those interesting questions from the from the audience. Yes, thank you very much. So, thanks for everything. Can you can you go to the next slide? Yes, thanks. Uh, before we conclude, uh, I just would like to um, uh, invite you or to remind you uh, our next event. So, uh, as each year, uh, we will attend the Incos International Symposium. Uh, this is undoubtedly the main federating event uh, of the system engineering community. Uh, I won't detail the whole program, but Capella will be well represented. Uh, through various uh, presentation and feedback. So if you have the opportunity, I'm strongly inviting you to, to join us at, uh, at this event. And I, I'm very happy to announce that the next Capella Day should be held in November. Um, like last year, uh, the event will be, will be virtual and you should receive more detailed information very shortly, uh, including a call for paper and submission deadline uh, will probably be for 1st of uh, September, so save the dates and feel free to submit if you have something interesting to, to share with, uh, with others. Okay, and as many uh, of uh, the attendees are probably working in the space domain, I just would like to remind there will be a, an MBSC workshop organized by the ESA end of September uh, call for paper closed a few days ago, so you won't be able to submit anymore. But uh, it's still time to register and to attend, of course. Uh, so that was for the main forthcoming event. So as usually, the webinar is recorded uh, and will be available in the Capella YouTube channel in the next days. Uh, in the meantime, 
feel free to have a look at the 50 or so videos already available. And if you're a Capella user and put to be, uh, we would be glad to see you joining the Capella adopters list. And in this purpose, uh, simply send us an email explaining, as explained in the, in the bottom of the, the adopters page. Okay, and, and of course, we are always happy to hear from, from you and discover your new usage. So if you have something interesting to share in this Capella, Capella webinar series, uh, please don't hesitate to, to contact us. So thanks again, Danilo. Thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thanks, thanks everyone for having attending this webinar. It was a pleasure for me to share this month with you. Have a good day and, and goodbye. Thank you.